Lord, may the meditation of my heart and the words of my mouth be pleasing and acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I wrote my sermon Saturday afternoon, and well, Saturday night occurred, so I want to try to bring these two things together. The first is that um, violence has always been a part of our society. It is not something new for us. And yet, here we are today... (coughs) After a presidential candidate, a former president, was millimeters away from being assassinated. Thankfully, it was his ear that was grazed. But a young man, a 20-year-old young man from Bethel Park, Pennsylvania. By the way, I went to youth group in Bethel Park, Pennsylvania. St. David's in Verona, which is in Bethel Park. That's where I went to youth group. So... It's like, whoa. Um, A young man from Bethel Park, Pennsylvania um, shot and injured a potential next president, a former president of the United States. So today I want to kind of talk about two things. One, I want to talk about the violence that occurred to John the Baptist. And how political violence has always been. And secondly, I want to talk about how here at Christ Church, we have people who are one end of the political spectrum to the very other end of the political spectrum. We have them all. We have people, I remember one of the, uh, the uh, old timers of the church when I first came said, hey, I remember a day when we had the president of Bell County Democratic Party and the president of the Republican Party here at Christ Church, both at the same exact church, and they were friends. They went out together. Well, here's the thing about politics now, as I think we can just all be aware of, is that it's fractured. Is that we live in a country where it's us and them. Where whatever tribe you belong to, you belong to wholeheartedly. And we have lost something of the world of civics. The world where we can agree to disagree. A world in which we can say, you know what? The way that you want to follow liberty and the pursuit of happiness and the way that your vision for this country is, is different than mine. But we need each other. We've lost that. We've seen it now for going on in, as far as I can remember, back to the Clinton campaign, this was, this was just going and going and going. Now, here's the thing. This may have been happening in the 60s. You know what I mean? But what I do know is this. Is that as a country, uh, we cannot let violence be the answer. We cannot. And we have allowed violence to be the answer. We have as a country allowed violence to be something that we have been okay with, something that we have helped, something that we have prepared for, something that we have stood behind. And that violence has now percolated itself to a young man, a 20-year-old young man, who decided to take it upon himself to do something. It's not the way it should be. Have you ever been caught in a lie? Have you ever been caught cheating? Have you ever done anything to try to cover something up? Right? This is my proper sermon, by the way, now. I'm getting into. Um, I remember once I was playing baseball in my uh, living room. And I was throwing the baseball against the couch. Boom. It was hot outside. I didn't want to go outside. So I'm throwing the baseball against the couch. It's hitting the couch, bouncing on the floor. I'm picking it up, throwing it back, and I'm doing this. And one time I go, whoom, and I kind of made a curveball happen. That's just bad aim for everyone in here. And it hit the corner of the couch. It bounced up, and my mom had a vase. Not a vase, a vase, because it was expensive. She had a vase. 
and the vase was on top of this little curio cabinet, and the baseball, the vase exploded. And I didn't know what to do. What are you supposed to do? I was nine or 10 at the time. What am I supposed to do? I don't know. The only thing I know is that this is, this is, I'm going to get a spanking out of this one. You know what I mean? Like this is a whooping. And so I immediately decide, okay, I'm going to cover it up. I gathered up all the chunks. I pushed everything into, the, into my hands. I carried it into my bedroom and I put it underneath some clothing in a closet. <laughs> See, today when we talk about John the Baptist, when we talk about David, we talk about people who are men after God's own heart. David, a man after God's own heart who commits murder, who commits adultery, who is eating food off the table that was not supposed to be eaten from, is blessing the people. He's not a priest. He's not allowed to do that. But this is, this is David. And we hear about John the Baptist, a man who walked around in camel hair, ate locusts and honey, had crazy hair, and was not someone that you wanted your daughter to date. And, and here's the thing. These two people are men after God's own heart. Every day, I'm told by someone, I'm not good enough to go to church. Every day I hear. I, there's, there's not a day that goes by that someone doesn't say something along the lines of, well, I go to church, but I'm just not good enough. And every time I hear that, I think, clearly these people have never read the scriptures. Because, I mean, maybe you murdered someone, and maybe you committed adultery, and maybe you're very unkept. And that just means that you're a man after God's own heart, according to the scriptures. There's, there is nothing you can do that means that you're not good enough to be here, right? Uh, because the Bible is filled with people who aren't good. In fact, it's kind of like all of them, except for one. So, today we see the work of God found in unexpected places. In, the, in David, the run of a litter of kids, right? In the cheating, murdering king. In a, in a man who, like Elijah, predicts the coming of the Savior only to be thrown in jail and to be killed, beheaded, because of the king's wife. The story of God is a story of people. And that means it's a story of people who are a mess, just like you and me. Remember that David danced before the Ark of the Covenant. And he blessed the people, right? In Michal, his, his uh, wife despised him for it, right? Why did she despise him? Because he was embarrassing everyone. So walking around with a pair of underwear, dancing like a crazy fool. That's embarrassing people, you know? And so his wife was embarrassed and despised him because of it. Today, we don't just talk about David and John the baptizer, though. We talk about mercy. We talk about God's work in our lives and how he's the one who brings about change. I was thinking this week a lot about Billy Joel. And I remember that, the song, that Down Easter Alexa. And uh, remember it says, like all locals here, I've had to sell my home. I'm too proud to beg. I work my fingers to the bone so that I can own my Down Easter Alexa. So I can take it to Long Island Sound. So I can sail. <coughs> I work my fingers to the bone. And we have a sense as Americans that if we work hard, we're owed something. That if we work hard, we should get it, right? We tell our children, if you work hard, you can be anything in the United States of America, right? He was told as a young man that if he worked hard, he would be a bay man in Nantucket Sound. It wasn't the case. And for us Christians who think that if we can just work a little bit harder, if we can be a little morally better, right? We can achieve some sort of spiritual acumen, like God will respect us more. But today the colic says this. 
O Lord, mercifully receive the prayers of your people who call upon you. Grant that they may know and understand what things they ought to do. And this is the key part. And also may have grace and power to accomplish them. We forget that without God's grace and power, we, through Jesus Christ our Lord, we cannot accomplish any of the oughts of life. See, the mercy of the Lord is what helps us. It's what cleanses us. It's what defends us. It's what keeps us safe. It's the Lord's help. It, by the way, this collect from Thomas Cramner, the first archbishop, archbishop of Canterbury, didn't bring this over from the Latin rites. This is a prayer that he devised for this Sunday. This theological treatise summarizes a pastoral and anthropological truth. Okay, big words. Anthropology, right? The way that you and I are as people. The theology of people, right? Thomas Cramner had a low theology of people. He didn't think we could do things. Because he watched people and he went, hmm, they say they can do stuff, but they can't. Yeah, that's what the Reformation was about, people. But he also had a very high Christology, meaning he believed that Jesus could do anything. And so we see that at work today. Cramner understood from the scriptures that God was not interested in the outward expressions that we have. He didn't care what we looked like or how we behaved. Because what happens is, what happens in the heart is what matters to God. Today we hear from Psalm 24. Who can ascend? Who can ascend to the great loftiness of God? Can't do it ourselves. So I told you I'd get back to, I uh, went into my closet. I pulled up the clothes. I'm nine or 10 years old. And what, what do I have access to? Elmer's glue. <laughs> so I used Elmer's glue and I glued the thing reasonably back together, but it's with glue, Elmer's glue. You know that Elmer's glue is not the best thing. It's, it's a rather cheap glue, you know? So I bring it and I think to myself that I made it. I've kind of like, this is my repentance. Um, and I was like, so I'm going to just bring it to my mom, tell her what happened. And she'll like, forgive me. Cause like, look, I, I basically put it back together. There was chunks missing. And so I bring it back and I set it down on the table and I said, mom, I'm sorry. I broke the vase, but, but, but I fixed it. And my mom looked at me. And I knew I was going to die. Uh, my mom looked at me and she said, I think we have different definitions of fix. Ooh. So, sometimes we try to fix things. But they can't be fixed. They can't be fixed. So, where are our hearts to be fixed? Where do we get our hearts fixed? At the cross. In the passion and the hollowed ground at the foot of the cross. Where like John the Baptist whose disciples take his body and lay them in a tomb. The difference between John the Baptist and Jesus we, we know very well. Is that John the Baptist was laid in the tomb and never came out. And Jesus was laid in the tomb three days later to not be found because he was alive. And our hearts are fixed because... Christ is alive in us and in you and me. Not self-improvement. Not seven ways to a better you. No. A new life because God died for you and rose again. That's what happens. That's the power that we all desire. Because it's the power that can change society. It's the power that we need so desperately in our civil society today. A remembrance that every one of us here our brothers and sisters in Christ. And this nation that we belong to is a temporal nation for you and me. It's going to come and go. But you and I belong to a nation in our, son, in our son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, right? In heaven that is eternal and everlasting. And it's that nation that we want to mirror on earth. A nation that doesn't say, 
We can't stand you because you think this way, or we can't stand you because you think that way. But a, a, a nation that says, we sacrifice together, we live in love as brothers and sisters in Christ, and we are together. And sure, we might think differently politically here and now, but we are one in Christ. So let us remember that as we remember to come to the fount of every blessing, that we can tune our hearts to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy that never cease call for songs of loudest praise. Lord, may we all be taught some melodious sonnet sung by the flaming tongues above so that we can praise you. Praise the mount, the place where you died, the cross. Oh, fix me on it, gods of unchanging love. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.